While the flight of any bird is impressive, perhaps the most remarkable flyer of them all is the world's smallest bird, the hummingbird. Not only can they fly backwards, they can even fly upside down. But the one maneuver for which they were designed is hovering. In fact, their ability to hover is vital to their survival. It allows them to dart from flower to flower, gathering food fast. Found only here in the Western Hemisphere, the hummingbird's range extends all the way from Alaska to Tierra del Fuego at the bottom of South America. Most of them, however, favor tropical and subtropical zones, as we'll see in our next film, Birds of the Sun God. Fork-tailed wood nymph, sapphire-fronted emerald, tourmaline sun angel, and ruby topaz. The names alone tell of man's fascination with hummingbirds and their jewel-like plumage. They're the most agile of all birds in the air, and yet they are servants of plants. In an evolutionary sense, it is plants that have shaped hummingbirds and dictated their fabulous colors. Inside each feather are countless microscopic mirrors which split, reflect, and recombine light into the colors of the rainbow. At certain angles, the birds appear to glow as their feathers refract the rays of the sun. Why should the hummingbirds have such spectacular colors? They're no songsters, but they do need, nevertheless, to advertise their presence, and they do it with their feathers. The Santa Ana Mountains in California are the home of the Anna's hummingbird. Each male signals its territorial claims with a brilliant display of color. When another hummingbird enters the territory, both birds display. If this clash of color fails to repel the intruder, then the home bird climbs to more than 150 feet and power dives towards its rival, flashing past it at 60 miles an hour. After dive bombing, the home bird climbs up into the sky again to check that all is clear. All hummingbirds, whether in California or the Andes of Ecuador, use their iridescent feathers to fight over territory. Possession of territory is essential to them, for within it grow flowers, and they produce the nectar on which the birds depend. Nectar, however, is not just a free meal, but a reward for carrying pollen from flower to flower. In most places of the world, of course, insects fill this role of pollinator. So why did these plants take up with different partners? The answer can be found in the tropical lowland rainforests of South America. It's here that hummingbirds first evolved. Their ancestors were probably insect-eating birds that probed for their prey in flowers. Then gradually, over a period of three million years or so, these birds came to feed not on insects, but on nectar. And as they did, they evolved physically to become more efficient at nectar drinking. There are still hummingbirds in the rainforests, pollinating as they feed.
But many plants within these warm, humid forests have kept their traditional pollinators, the insects. Winged insects like these butterflies have one limitation as pollinators. They're cold-blooded and fragile, and therefore sometimes unreliable. When rain drenches the forest, they must find shelter, leaving the plants unserved. By contrast, warm-blooded and relatively robust hummingbirds can remain active during a tropical downpour. Indeed, they even seem to enjoy it. While the insects are still sheltering, the hummingbirds are on the wing. Flying in all weather, they come through with the pollen. In return, plants have developed a nectar specially suited to the hummingbird's needs. It's liquid and more easily sipped than the nectar that insects like. At higher, colder altitudes, insects may have difficulty in flying, but the warm-blooded hummingbirds are active all day long no matter what the weather, and so many plants have adopted them as pollinators. Many peaks in the Andes rise far above the clouds, and here the hummingbirds truly come into their own. Over half the flowering plants here are pollinated by hummingbirds. Wherever poor weather, rain, cloud, or cold limits insect flight, plants in South America have evolved partnerships with hummingbirds. Once the deal was struck, then evolutionary consequences followed. Plants, even very large plants like puyas, provide only limited amounts of nectar for their messengers. This in turn sets the upper size limit for hummingbirds. The shining sunbeam is average in size for a hummingbird, about as big as a wren. The biggest of all the family, the giant hummingbird of the Andes, is about twice as large. As big as a starling, though only half its weight, the giant depends on large plants like the puyas. At the top of the tall stalk, the flower head is two feet high and has enough nectar to power the giant for about 20 minutes, just long enough for it to reach another puya. In this way, the plant forces the giant to fly on and complete the job of pollination. The tiniest hummingbirds, however, are the smallest warm-blooded animals in the world. Just which is the smallest, no one can really say. Their size variations are so slight, they're hard to measure. One of the smallest lives here on the floor of the tropical rainforest, aptly named Little Hermit. Like all hummingbirds, it has a high metabolism to maintain its warm body temperature. It must feed every three to five minutes. At this size, hummingbirds come into direct conflict with insects like the butterfly and have reached the limits of miniaturization for body parts like heart and bones.
As hummingbirds evolved, so did their plant partners, adapting to the special characteristics of new pollinators. Plants specializing in insect messengers attract them by scent, for insects have an acute sense. Flat open flowers have convenient landing platforms and contain concentrated nectar and sticky pollen. Hummingbird plants have a very different design. Their flowers are long and tubular to exclude insects. They have no scent, for birds have a relatively poor sense of smell. And they're placed literally out on a limb, out of the reach of insects, very few of which can hover efficiently. The pollen is held out in front so that it brushes the head or bill of a hummingbird as it probes for nectar. Hummingbirds have long, thin bills suited to the shape of the flower, and even longer tongues to reach the nectaries at the flower's base. The relationship between flower and bill shape has, in some cases, been taken to extremes. This strange plant is a type of heliconia, and it's pollinated exclusively by one species of hummingbird. The bizarrely shaped bracts protect heliconia's delicate yellow flowers, and it's these that have determined the shape of the beak of this hummingbird, the sicklebill. The flowers are deeply curved so that no straight-billed hummingbirds can sip from them. Only the sickle bill can reach the nectar at the base of the flowers. And as the bird feeds only from heliconias, the plant's pollen is guaranteed delivery to the correct destination. The large bush-like datura is another specialist. It too has an exclusive relationship with just one species of hummingbird. The flowers are huge, six to eight inches long. Their sheer size stops all hummingbirds, except one, from reaching the nectaries. Though others may occasionally try to reach the riches deep within, they have no chance of feeding from this giant among flowers. Even when perched on the lip of the bell, this train barrow hummingbird can only reach halfway up the tube. There is just one bird whose anatomy matches that of the flower, this one. This is the sword bill, and it has the longest bill relative to its body size of any bird in the world. In fact, the bill is longer than the body. The sword bill refreshes itself on the flower parts other birds can't reach. With this private food store tucked away for its exclusive use, the sword bill, like the sickle bill, has no need to defend a territory. Accordingly, both birds are relatively dull, for with no territory, bright colors are not necessary. Whatever the relationship between flower and bird, all hummingbirds have mastered the freedom of the air. When the action is slowed down 40 times, we see how the hummingbirds achieve such virtuosity. The wings are rigid, the wing bones fused, the only movement is around the shoulder joint. The bird rotates its wings at the end of each sweep and so gains power on both strokes.
In contrast, most birds like this fowry tern flex their wings, bending the arm at the elbow and wrist. Only hummingbirds fly with stiff wings, a technique that gives them great aerial agility, but at a cost. As much as one-third of a hummingbird's weight comes from the relatively huge muscles that are needed to power their unique way of flying. Few other birds can hover for any time without the aid of wind. Even those that can, like this Himalayan sunbird, appear clumsy in comparison. The wings of a hummingbird, like this booted racket tail, beat 70 times a second. To drive their wing muscles, they must convert their food into energy at great speed. In fact, they can do so faster than any other animal. Hummingbirds are trapped in a sort of catch-22. They need super-rich nectar, but to reach it, the birds must spend large amounts of energy. On the wing, its heart rate is 1,200 beats a minute. Even at rest, the heart races at 480 beats compared to our own 70. But hummingbirds don't spend all the time on the wing. Over half the day is spent perching or grooming those all-important feathers. Hummingbirds are living dynamos, their pace of life frenetic. But each evening they face a major problem. How can a bird whose body requires a fresh supply of fuel every 10 to 15 minutes survive the night? Hummingbirds solve the problem by turning down the motors in their bodies. They go into torpor, a sort of nightly hibernation. The heart rate slows to a mere 36 beats a minute, and body temperature drops in half, from about 110 to 55 degrees. By these extreme means, hummingbirds have solved their greatest problem. The ability to go into torpor, combined with their extraordinary body design and flying technique, have given hummingbirds a unique, if somewhat precarious, position in the bird world but they're very successful. Almost anywhere in the Americas where there are abundant flowers, you can find hummingbirds. Even high on the bleak altiplano of the Andes, there lives a hummingbird. To survive the cruel sub-zero winds of night, it shelters in a lava cave high on the slopes of the volcano Cotopaxi, flying out just before sunrise. The Andean hill star lives at around 15,000 feet, just below the permanent snow line. At this altitude, the air is cold and thin. Cotopaxi is only 45 miles south of the equator, and yet it takes several hours for the sun to break the icy grip of night.
It requires a great deal of energy to hover in this thin air. This strange plant, the high altitude Chukiragua, provides a perch for the hill star and saves the hummingbird the cost of hovering. In return, the Andean hill stars act as the Chukaragua's only pollinators, spending all their lives on the bleak slopes of the volcanoes. While one hummingbird survives in the harsh beauty of the high Andes, another lives in the arid deserts. The tiny Costas hummingbird migrates into the Colorado desert each spring. The Costas will remain in the desert as the temperature rises to more than 100 degrees in summer. They feed on hummingbird plants like the chuparosa. Unique among hummingbirds, they seem capable of surviving without water, getting all the liquid they need from their food. The costas migrate only a few hundred miles from the mountains of Mexico into the desert. But in South America, there is another hummingbird that flies 1,800 miles to these dank, dark woods fringed by icebergs. Green-backed firecrowns spend the summer here in Patagonia. Some even visit bleak Tierra del Fuego, just a few hundred miles farther south. The reason for the bird's marathon migration lies within the cool, wet forest. Wild fuchsias grow in abundance. In the short southern summer, the fire crowns will raise their young before flying north again. Wherever hummingbirds live, nesting is the time that places greatest strain on the adult. For these birds that exist on an energy tightrope must now meet the needs of their young as well as themselves. The male takes no part in the business of nest building or rearing the chicks. Left alone, as indeed are most female hummingbirds, the sparkling violet ear builds her nest above an Andean stream. It takes her about a week to complete the structure. With the nest complete, the sparkling violet ear, like all hummingbirds, lays just two eggs. They're small and very fragile, often no bigger than peas, and they're protected by a final lining of flower stamens a reminder of the intricate relationship between bird and plant. Incubation of the eggs reveals just how precarious living can be for these highly tuned aerial athletes. To spend long enough on the eggs to keep them warm, the female must feed less. To achieve this, she actually drops her body temperature to reduce the need for food. Only by this drastic measure can she manage to incubate. Nesting is not just a difficult period for the female. The great majority of deaths in hummingbirds occur in the nest. Often the cold, wet climate is the culprit. In this case, one fragile egg was damaged and only one chick had. The mother, her body temperature back to normal, now faces the challenge of feeding the chick. The growing youngster needs protein, 
and the mother catches insects one at a time. She takes up to 100 in a session and goes fly catching 20 times a day, delivering as many as 2,000 insects to the chick. The nest-bound chick, now two weeks old, is already a creature of the air. Special feathers on its back detect the downdraft of its mother's wings and stimulate the chick to beg. The extra wear and tear of motherhood makes the daily bath even more important than usual. The waiting chick, now three weeks old, is as large as its mother. It may weigh slightly more. The bird will soon leave the nest and the extra fat is quickly burned in vigorous practice for the first flight. For the last few days in the nest, the mother changes the youngster's diet, giving it an increased amount of nectar to power the chick's freshly feathered wings. The young hummingbird makes a hesitant start to its life on the wing. Once out of the nest, the chick has left behind the most dangerous period of its life because few predators are agile enough to catch hummingbirds in the air. Hummingbirds deserve all kinds of superlatives. The most skillful of all flyers, the smallest of all warm-blooded creatures, and surely the most dazzlingly colorful of all birds. And they developed all those characteristics as a consequence of becoming the servants of plants. Nature is made possible by public television stations. By Siemens, a leader in high technology electronics and electrical engineering. Nationwide, 27,000 Americans in 400 locations. The name is Siemens. And by your gas company and America's gas industry, bringing natural gas through a million miles of underground pipelines to 160 million people. Watch our next nature program this evening at 8 when we explore the beautiful Emerald Sea off the coast of Canada's British Columbia. That's tonight at 8, right here on Channel 2. Stay with us now as we go back to Chernobyl, back to the site of that horrible 1986 nuclear accident in Russia on Nova, followed by a look at the climate puzzle on planet Earth at noon. <laughs> 